This is the story of an Airbus A320. Well, I'd love to tell you more about the plane and the operator, but the German investigators are surprisingly tight-lipped about who the operator was. I mean, I've read a few of their reports, and it's how they do things. I'm just glad that they publish reports and that it's in English. No complaints here. What we do know is that this occurred on the 21st of March, 2001. The A320 was flying from Frankfurt to Paris with 115 passengers on board. The pilots arrived at the airport a bit early as they had some extra pre-flight checks to do today. The captain had 9,300 hours of experience and even had an acrobatics rating on his license. The first officer had about 2,000 hours of experience. The airplane that they would be flying had been in maintenance for the past few days, so they needed to conduct a few extra checks to make sure that the plane was fit to fly. Once the engines were started, and before they started taxiing, the pilots conducted a flight control check to make sure that everything was working as intended. They noted no irregularities, and so they started to taxi to runway 18. The plane lined up with the runway, and the pilots added power. The takeoff was normal. Once they hit the rotate speed, the captain pulled back, taking the A320 into the sky. Right after takeoff, the captain noticed that something was wrong. The plane was banking to the left, just a tiny bit. He tried to correct it, but that only seemed to make the problems worse. As the captain tried to stabilize his plane, the bank to the left grew. Eventually, they were banking to the left by about 22 degrees. This was when they were just feet off the ground. The captain said, I can't do anything more, indicating that the plane was not responding to his inputs in the way that he expected the plane to. The first officer said, I have control, and pushed the takeover button. From the right seat, he found that he was able to control the plane much better. The crew took the plane to 12,000 feet to try and troubleshoot the problem. The captain tried to control the plane from the left seat, but to their dismay, the plane did the exact opposite of what the captain was commanding. If the captain commanded a left turn, the plane would go right. But that problem did not exist on the other side stick. With such peculiar behavior, the pilots had no idea what else could be wrong with this plane. So they decided that landing back at Frankfurt was the best thing to do. The first officer then took control and landed the A320 back with no further issues. Now, this incident does not sound like it was that bad. But looking at the flight data, we can see how close they came to disaster. This graph shows that their maximum bank was 21.42 degrees. Now, that's not too extreme. But right below that, they show you the readout from the radio altimeter. They were banking to the left at almost 22 degrees when they were barely 10 feet off the ground. The slightest mistake then would have sent this plane crashing back down. The only reason that the bank didn't get worse was because the first officer had been instinctively commanding a right bank even before he took over from the captain. Had it not been for his moderating inputs, this would have been bad. Once the plane was on the ground, they handed the plane over to the ground staff, who did a control check. When they did that, they found that the ailerons initially moved in the right direction. But then for some reason, they moved in the opposite direction. Something was very wrong with this plane. To understand what went wrong with this plane, we need to look at the computers. As you know, the Airbus A320 is a fly-by-wire aircraft. So, there are no physical linkages between the pilot side sticks and the control surfaces themselves. All the inputs are routed through the computers, and then the computers commanded the physical deflection of the control surfaces. To do all this, the A320 had two ELACs, or elevator aileron computers, and then three spoiler elevator computers, or SECs. The SECs could step in for the ELACs if the ELACs were to fail for some reason. Also, the plane had two flight augmentation computers. Digging into the history of the A320, they noticed that it had been having issues with its ELACs in the past. This was traced to a bent pin in one of the connectors that connected both ELAC computers. The bent pin was on the ELAC one side. They tried to replace just the connector, but that didn't work out. 
So they tried to replace just the subsection of the entire connector, but they still didn't have a suitable spare subsection. So they decided to replace all four quadrants. This meant that they'd have to remove and reconnect 420 individual connections. To do this, they'd use the one-to-one -one method. Basically, they'd have to unseat one connection and then transfer it over to the new adapter. Basically, it's fancy speak for remove and replug. Remove and replug. Do that 420 times and you're done. But the problem was that you couldn't just do it. You had to refer to the aircraft wiring list and the aircraft wiring manual. Those documents would tell you exactly where to connect what. The replacement for the first three quadrants went fine. That was done in the morning shift. But the last segment was supposed to be done in another shift. This is where a mistake was made. In the aircraft wiring manual, there were two pages that could apply to this fix, page two or page four. You had to choose between the two using something known as an effectivity value and what all service bulletins had been applied to the plane. They mistakenly went with the instructions on page four instead of page two. They're mostly the same. They show you how to connect the wires that come from the pilot side stick to the ELAC, but both of them had one big difference. In the page two version, the colors are interchanged. The blue one goes to the red one and the red one goes to the blue one. But on page four, there's no switching. Blue goes to blue and red goes to red. I don't know why it was in blue to blue and red to red all the time, but that's how things were. Since they went by the instructions on page four, the wires coming from the pilot side stick on the left side to the computer were flipped. The red wire went where the blue wire should have gone and the blue wire went where the red wire should have gone. There's even more stuff with this wiring system that made no sense. Most cable pairs used a red-blue format, but out of the 420 connectors, two pairs, that is 0603 and 0597, used the blue-red format. For no apparent reason, the investigators asked Airbus why they decided to switch things up for two seemingly random pairs. And they were just like, it's a transitionary thing. We'll eventually change it so the wiring on all Airbus planes are the same. But this on its own should not have resulted in the incident. After major changes like this have been made, checks are done to see if there are any problems with the plane. They did do tests, and the test threw up a few ECAM warnings. But none of the warnings were related to the reversed cables in the belly of the plane. They then had to do a functional check. But this was only done from the right-hand side stick. They never checked the left-hand side stick. In addition to that, Airbus mandated that maintenance workers do a wire continuity check so as to make sure that all the connections have been made correctly. But the maintenance workers did not do that, as the maintenance company's standard manual did not call for it. It was optional. Also, Airbus's documentation did not make it clear which side stick to use for the test. Investigators asked the maintenance company why a test had not been done on both side sticks. They thought that the problem in the system could be detected using any one of the side sticks, which was incorrect. Which begs the question, why did this operator, whoever they are, choose a maintenance company that was so prone to making mistakes? Well, as it turned out, the airline did not do its due diligence when it picked its maintenance partner. No audits were done to see if they were any good. But there's one final question. Why didn't the crew catch this mistake in their pre-departure control check? Well, the documentation just asked them to check for full deflection of the ailerons and not the direction of the deflection. So when they saw that the ailerons could deflect to its full capacity, they decided that everything was all right. This near miss would have ended in an accident had it not been for the pilots. The first officer in particular, when he saw that the captain was losing control, he did not hesitate to step in and say, I have control. Quote, the philosophy of a flat cockpit hierarchy between both pilots, which is taught and practiced in the operator's fleet, may have decisively contributed towards the prevention of an accident. End quote. 
In many accidents, we see that first officers are the ones that can see that things are going wrong. Sometimes they don't want to speak up or take action because they don't want to offend or upstage the captain, who is more experienced and higher up the chain of command. But empowering the junior pilot to speak up saved this A320 from crashing. This was a lesson that we learned after countless crashes, like that of Alitalia Flight 404. But I'm so glad to see that the lessons that we learned are now saving lives in the real world. If you want to see what happens when a captain does not listen to his first officer, you can watch my video on Air India Express Flight 1344. Link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.